This is the Daily Signal podcast for Tuesday, November 26th. I'm Kate Trinko. And I'm Daniel Davis. As more people experiment with transgenderism, more people are backtracking and regretting their decisions. In many cases, those decisions have lasting consequences. I recently spoke with Kathy Grace Duncan. She's a transgender survivor whose story begins in the early 80s. We'll share that interview. And we'll also share a doctor's perspective. Andre Moll has observed the harmful trend toward putting kids on puberty blockers. He offers a much better alternative. And if you're enjoying this podcast, please be sure to leave a review or a five-star rating on iTunes and encourage others to subscribe. Now on to our top news. President Trump is continuing to protect Eddie Gallagher, a Navy SEAL accused of war crimes. According to CNN, Defense Secretary Mark Esper said that President Trump ordered him to let Gallagher keep his status as a Navy SEAL, despite resistance from top Navy officers. Just a week before that, President Trump had reversed Gallagher's demotion. That sparked concern among military leaders that Trump's intervention would erode discipline and order in the military. At that point, Navy Secretary Richard Spencer launched a formal review to determine whether Gallagher was fit to serve. But over the weekend, news emerged that he tried to negotiate a secret deal with the White House in which Gallagher would be protected. For that, the Secretary of Defense fired him. Senator Lindsey Graham isn't backing down on his calls for a closer look at former Vice President Joe Biden, his son Hunter, and their dealings with Ukraine. Despite criticism from the former Vice President, Graham, a Republican from South Carolina and Senate Judiciary Chairman, told reporters per Politico, I like Joe Biden. I like him a lot. I think he's a fine man. I'm not saying Joe did anything wrong, but I want to see the transcripts. But... If there's nothing there, I'll be the first one to say there's nothing there. But we're not going to live in a country where only one party gets investigated. Graham also tweeted on Monday, I love Joe Biden as a person, but we are not going to give a pass to what is obviously a conflict of interest. I believe Hunter Biden's association on the Burisma board doesn't pass the smell test. If a Republican was in the same position, they'd certainly be investigated. Well, on Monday, President Trump honored Conan, the military dog that was wounded in the operation that killed ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Here's what Trump said at the Rose Garden ceremony. The dog is incredible, actually incredible. We spent some good time with it. And uh, so brilliant, so smart. Uh, the way it uh, was with the special forces people that it worked with, and for obvious reasons, they can't be out in front of the media. But they did a fantastic job. Conan did a fantastic job. And uh, we're very honored to have Conan here and to have given Conan a certificate and an award. The Supreme Court announced it won't hear a case involving National Review, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and a key scientist in the climate change debate, Michael Mann. Mann sued National Review and Competitive Enterprise Institute over an analogy that compared his approach to climate change data to child abuser Jerry Sandusky. In a column last month, National Review Editor-in-Chief Rich Lowry said man's purpose in suing us is clear enough to bleed us of time and, most importantly, resources in order to punish us for having the temerity to harshly criticize his work. Mann tweeted after the decision, We are pleased with this nearly unanimous decision by the Supreme Court to deny the appeal by the National Review and Competitive Enterprise Institute in our defamation case against them. We are looking forward to the trial. Justice Samuel Alito dissented from the decision not to hear the case. He wrote, Climate change has staked a place at the very center of this nation's public discourse. Politicians, journalists, academics, and ordinary Americans discuss and debate various aspects of climate change daily, its causes, extent, urgency, consequences, and the appropriate policies for addressing it. The core purpose of the constitutional protection of freedom of expression is to ensure that all opinions on such issues have a chance to be heard and considered. 
I do not suggest that speech that touches on an important and controversial issue is always immune from challenge under state defamation law, and I express no opinion on whether the speech at issue in this case is or is not entitled to First Amendment protection. But the standard to be applied in a case like this is immensely important. Pro-democracy leaders in Hong Kong are celebrating a landslide election victory over pro-China candidates. On Monday, dozens of new city councillors elected on Sunday gathered at Hong Kong Polytechnic University to support protesters still trapped inside. Those protesters have been caught in a standoff with police since last week. The newly elected leaders called for a political solution to the social unrest that has engulfed the city for five months and has only intensified. The protest movement stems back to a Beijing-backed bill that would have restricted the freedoms enjoyed by Hong Kong residents. Protesters have demanded, among other things, democratic reforms to the city's government, which currently gives disproportionate weight to Beijing-backed leaders. The newly elected pro-democracy leaders will only control low-level affairs concerned with neighborhood governance. But protesters hope that the electoral shift, even at that level, will re-energize the pro-democracy movement. Sweet 16 and ready to vote? A Massachusetts town approved letting 16-year-olds vote, but they'll still need to get sign-off from the state government to actually let the younger teens participate in our democratic process. The town of Brookline, Massachusetts, voted to let 16- and 17-year-olds vote in municipal elections and even be local officials themselves, according to a local CBS affiliate. Earlier this year, Representative Ayanna Presley, a Democrat from Massachusetts, proposed letting 16-year-olds vote with an amendment to a House bill. Up next, my conversation with Kathy Grace Duncan, a transgender survivor. Tired of high taxes, fewer health care choices, and bigger government? Become a part of the Heritage Foundation. We're fighting the rising tide of homegrown socialism while developing conservative solutions that make families more free and more prosperous. Find out more at heritage.org. Well, I'm joined now by Kathy Grace Duncan. She is a transgender survivor, and she's here to share some of her story. Uh, Kathy Grace, thanks for your time today. You're welcome. Um, My first question for you, Kathy Grace, is um, when in your life did you first uh, begin to think that you were a man? We hear more and more stories these days of people who have uh, gone transgender, some of whom have uh, have now reversed. And very often this begins in childhood. Was that the case for you? Yes, absolutely. So before I went to kindergarten, probably, you know, ages three to four, um, I would ride my tricycle over to get my girlfriend, pick her up. We were going to get married. So I... I knew that there was that I wanted to be a boy and I would play like a boy. Um, So it was definitely way before kindergarten. Okay. And at what point did you decide to actually begin to live as a man? When I was 19, I um, started taking the hormones and then uh, changed my name. And was there any, when was this, back in the 80s, 90s? Yeah, 1982. Okay. Uh, I I would imagine this wasn't a very well-known or common thing at the time. Was, no. was there a medical procedure that you had to go through? Yeah, I was evaluated by a psychologist, and then he referred me to a family doctor who uh, prescribed the hormones. Uh, the I guess you could call an evaluation. He wanted to be sure that you know this is something I really wanted to do. Um, there wasn't really the why did you want to do this or any of that. It's just like, okay, well, let me get you to this doctor, and he'll give you the hormones for it. And how did that affect you? Um, Taking the hormones? Yeah, yeah. Um, So at first it seemed slow, uh, but then within three months, you know, my voice had dropped and starting to have the peach fuzz for the um, beard and all of that. And then eventually I started having male pattern baldness and uh, I worked out. So I I actually honestly took a little bit extra so I could get big, you know, uh, as I worked out. As you were transitioning... Did you ever have any moments of regret at this point, or were you still on board uh, for it? Um, I don't think through the whole time that I lived as a man I had any regret, because I thought I had I was free. I thought living this way um, was where I was supposed to be my entire life. So how long uh, did you continue in this pattern? 
Um, I lived as a man for 11 years. Okay. So that would have gotten you to age 30? Yep. And then what what changed your mind? Well, um, actually an encounter with Jesus. Um, so four years prior to that, I believe that he started working on my heart to bring me out of that. And he called to me and he said, will you now? Will you now? And I took this inventory of my life and I thought, I haven't got anything to lose, nothing holding me back. So I said yes, and I jumped in to spending more time in the Word and at church and getting more involved in the church. And then at the end of that four years, which would have been the end of the 11, um, the, I was confronted by my church and they asked me who I was. And I told them, well, I'm a woman living as a man. And the Holy Spirit blew into me. And when that happened, I realized, oh, I need to go back to being the woman that God created me to be and step down from all these ministries. Wow. Were you raised in the church? Um, I was raised Lutheran, so I would say sort of. I knew who God was, but I didn't really follow him necessarily. So your upbringing would have taught you that this was not right, to to live as the opposite sex? Yeah, but, you know, when when you're so driven by it, it's hard to know that that's true. Mm -hmm. So, um, so really it was, it was your encounter with Christ and your faith that, that brought you out of transgenderism. Yeah. Yeah. Him showing me that this is, this is not the best for you. This is not how I created you. So how has your relationship with God shaped your identity from that time onward? Well, um, in the beginning, I spent lots of time with him just saying, I don't know what I'm doing. What is this supposed to be like? And, the, you know, because of the way I looked from the effects of the hormones, um, I was like, okay, so, Lord, you need to change all of this. You need to take away the beard. You need to grow my hair back. I cried out for all these physical changes. And finally, the Lord said to me, I don't care about those things. I'm really after your heart. And that's when I realized, okay, so there's a heart change that needs to happen. So um, it was just continuing to spend time with him and realizing that who he created me to be is good. The word said it was good. You know, he created male and female and they were very good. And so it was learning how to embrace that and then also addressing the lies that I believed that pushed me to be a man. Mm -hmm. Um, Part of it was, you know, growing up in a dysfunctional family, I believed that women were hated, women were weak, women were vulnerable, and I didn't didn't want that. You know, I didn't want to grow up and be those things. Mm -hmm. Um, And so being a man was the only other option that I felt was good. Um, and I'd be able to survive that. Mm. And, and as you've embraced being a woman, has, have you found yourself becoming more at peace in, in that? I mean, because I, we hear, um, we've been hearing some stories of people who, you know, say they, they, they transition to the other gender because they always felt that they were at, a, at odds with their body. Have you felt more at peace in, in being a woman? Yeah, I would say that as I... As I've understood the truth about who I am and how we're created and how he's wired me, um, there is. You know, when I come into agreement and I and I understand the lies that drove that drove me to that, um, then it's able. Then I'm able to see. You know, what the Lord is calling me to. Again, it's not. It wasn't the battle between the light and the darkness. It was the battle between the truth and the lie. And really recognizing what is that lie, you know, and then finding the truth to replace that lie. So it was um, confronting the lie, basically, and going, okay, so then what is the truth of that? And then how do I embrace that? How do I make that part of my life? And that was, again, coming back to my relationship with the Lord and trusting Him that He knew what He was talking about. Well, there's a push nowadays to get um, children, younger and younger, to uh, think in terms of gender identity and to f- try to figure out their own gender irrespective to their body. And um, it puts a lot of pressure on kids. And uh, we're hearing stories come out of, of kids transitioning, going through puberty blockers. What would you say to a young kid who's confused about their gender and is considering this? Sure. Um, I think rather than addressing that symptom, you know, because really that's all it is, is a symptom of a deeper something that's going on. And it's trying to look past and asking the why. Why do you want to live as a man? Why do you think that that's better? Why do you think it's safer? Why is your gender bad? 
you know, and exploring what is the ideas around that and then addressing those things. Because usually it's, you know, a place of trauma that or perceived trauma for them that says, oh, this is not good. Who I am is not good. And detaching from that and actually becoming hateful of your own self. And that was one of the things I really had to deal with was deep, deep self-hatred um, just because, you know, I was a woman. And so it's looking at that and those young kids. And then I think also it's kind of like that wait and see. Yeah, they're struggling now as five, you know, because gender dysphoria does start very, very young. But it's seeing how they grow up. You know, where are you at in age 12? Because some of the kids, you know, girls, especially when they've been heavy-duty tomboys, mm-hmm. when they reach 15, 16, they're like, no, I want to be a girl. I like being a girl. Right. You know, they totally grow out of that. Yeah, that's something that, a point that often gets missed in the debate is that you're putting young kids before puberty on puberty blockers. Well, after puberty, they might change their mind. They're still developing. That's right. That's right. Lawmakers are considering um, gender identity now, thinking in terms of that, uh, thinking in terms of, of um, transgender status. Um, what would you say to, to lawmakers who are considering bills that would allow you know, the opposite uh, gender to enter bathrooms, say, in schools? Um, we've heard about um, uh, boys identifying as girls, going into girls' bathrooms, locker rooms. Um, what would you say to lawmakers who are thinking about this? Well, I guess my question for them would be, have you, have you considered the emotional health? You know, have you looked at these kids emotionally? Yeah, they're saying, this is what I feel, but your, your feelings can lie to you. And I can tell you that. <laughs> they lie to you. The way you feel is not always the truth. But it's, they need to look underneath all of that. I feel that I'm a boy. Okay, why do you feel that you're a boy? I would encourage them to look at, you know, do you have the data around the emotional health of that child, you know, and looking at the data for those who have already gone through that and have regret and the emotional trauma that they've gone through and now they can't really change back necessarily or fully change back. So I I would encourage them, you need to look beyond the symptoms and you need to get to the cause. What is the root cause of that? before you pass any laws about gender identity and boys going into girls' bathroom, because I think that also produces predatory habits. You know, the, the boys that realize, oh, I can say I'm a girl and go into the girls' bathroom, you know, we have predators among us too, you know? So it, they just need to look beyond the symptoms. Well, Kathy Grace, really appreciate you sharing from your story and uh, for your time today. Absolutely.